Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that your Son may glorify you. And through the power that you have given him, let him give eternal life to all those you have entrusted to him. And eternal life is this, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth and finished the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, it is time for you to glorify me with the glory I had with you before the beginning of the world. Perhaps in the room of retreat, where we are waiting for the power from on high with Our Lady and her companions, someone who had been present at the Last Supper leaned into the group and said, Do you remember? Do you remember when he said that thing about how the hour had come and how he talked about glory? And perhaps Mary at that moment remembered another of her son's references to the coming of an hour, made at a very different meal, made not as here with what sounds like the solemnity of liturgical prayer, the weightiness of preaching with authority, but as a puzzling, even a troubling aside, at first sight a brush off. They have no wine, she told him, at the wedding feast at which she, along with Jesus and his followers, were guests. And he replied, What is that to me, woman? My hour has not yet come. The Church has always invited us not simply to contrast these two moments, as, on one hand, an almost banal episode of social embarrassment, and, on the other, an imperious, if perplexing, summons to attend, as world-changing events unfold before our eyes. It is not as though only the Lord's words at the Last Supper, and not also those at Cana, have any connection with glory. On the contrary, Perhaps his hour had not yet come at those village nuptials, and yet, we are told, the miracle he performed there, a miracle of superabundant bestowal of fine wine when the party was flagging, was one in which, quite precisely, his glory was made manifest. Jesus, we are told, did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory. The transformation of water into wine is a sign, then, it points to something other than itself. And what it points to is about to take place as Jesus speaks to his friends at the Last Supper. If the glory of God can be revealed, both in the earthly conviviality of a small provincial town feasting a young couple tying the knot, and in a man going out into the darkness of betrayal and contempt to a brutal judicial murder, then this is a strange sort of glory, perhaps one that scarcely seems to befit the deity whose glory flares out at the burning bush and in the temple. Jesus at Cana, Jesus en route to Calvary, neither of these images, both in very different ways so mundane, so very much of this world, are obviously revelatory of the divine majesty. And yet the Lord himself tells us, this is the glory, the very glory, that he enjoyed with the Father before the beginning of the world. This is indeed the glory of God, the glory of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And perhaps our very familiarity with the story of Jesus enables us sometimes to deny, to evade precisely the strangeness of it. We have forgotten, or we have chosen to forget, so much. And perhaps we need to put these two images, Jesus at the wedding, Jesus on his way to the cross, consciously side by side, to recall ourselves to the strangeness of the truth. Sometimes in the history of the church, Perhaps sometimes in our own lives, the language of glory and majesty has been quite straightforwardly conscripted to suggest that might is inevitably right, that if we have God on our side, we are justified in using whatever means lie in our power to ensure that his cause prevails. We forget, then, that the hour of glory comes in its fullness when a man in agony on the cross refuses to send for legions of angels to rescue him, when he defeats death and evil and hatred not by deploying superior firepower, but by changing decisively the rules of engagement. Sometimes in the history of the church, perhaps sometimes in our own lives, more subtly, but at least as devastatingly, suffering has been given a perverse pride of place, because it makes us look like that man in agony on the cross, who is also God Almighty. We can tell ourselves, or still more shockingly tell others, that the more we suffer the better, because the more like Jesus it will make us. We forget, then, that Jesus at Calvary is the same Jesus who comes that we may have abundant life, the life so winningly imaged in the well-oiled song and dance of a wedding feast in full swing. 
And indeed, we forget that these episodes, Cana and the Cross, deeply mysteriously, are not two isolated scenes, with nothing in common between them except their dramatis personae, so much as two sides of the same coin. The hour that has not yet come when Mary nudges her son to provide wine for the wedding guests will come when she stands at the foot of his cross to see him provide the definitive new wine that will never run out, the new wine of his power and love offered to all the thirsty who throughout the ages will come to him to drink. This is all deeply mysterious. Mysterious with the very mystery of God. It would be so much more comprehensible in a certain sense so much easier if God's omnipotent strength wasn't made manifest in weakness. So much more straightforward if we could simply see in the suffering of the cross a license to respond to our own suffering with self-indulgent melodrama and to that of others with indifference. But that would be to worship something other than the true God, to put in his place idols of our own making. If we want instead to know the true God and thus to have eternal life, we need to ask the Spirit to lead us into all truth. Lead us, that is, into an ever more truthful, more clear-sighted knowledge and love of the one whose work was publicly inaugurated at Cana and completed in his death, resurrection and ascension, the work of revealing the inebriatingly wonderful glory of God. So let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love, Send forth your spirit, O Lord, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant by the gift of the same Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.